are listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. We have a special guest joining us from Allergy Asthma Foundation of America, also known as AFA. So if you hear AFA during this episode, we mean Allergy Asthma Foundation of America. What we discuss on this episode are the factors that can impact air quality and how this impacts our health, focusing mainly on asthma and seasonal allergies. We dive into two topics when it comes to air. We talk about air pollution and we talk about climate change. Then we're going to round out this episode by talking about the Allergy Capital Report, which is something put out annually by AFA. If you don't think climate change is something that impacts you, but you have asthma and seasonal allergies, this episode will change your mind because climate change impacts much more than just the polar bears. Today we are talking to the CEO and president of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, or AFA, Kenneth Mendes. Kenny has been with AFA since 2018. Before that, he worked at Walt Disney and was the COO of the nonprofit Trout Unlimited, America's largest cold water fishery conservation organization. Kenneth's work with AFA has seen their online asthma community triple as he came to them with the mission of reducing the impact of asthma and allergy on the underserved. Great. Thank you. It's great to be here. Before we jump into getting into quality of air, let's recap what seasonal allergies are, because that's going to be something that's going to come up a couple of times. And I think it's just nice to have that groundwork. So Dr. G, can you give us a recap on seasonal allergies? Sure. So, you know, seasonal allergies are often referred to as hay fever by some people, and they're caused by pollen in the environment. So generally, trees release their pollen in the spring, grass in the summer, and weeds in the fall. When someone is allergic, they are sensitive to the this pollen and their body triggers the release of histamine, which causes inflammation and results in allergic symptoms, including itchy eyes, runny nose, congestion, and for some coughing and difficulty breathing or asthma. So allergies can cause allergies of the eyes, nose, or even asthma, which is allergies of the lungs. Perfect. So that's a great groundwork when we get into a little bit more of why it's important that we're going to be talking about air quality. So what is air quality and why is air quality important for people with allergies and asthma? Well, the first thing is allergies, as Dr. G just said, when you have pollen during allergy season, that causes you to sneeze, have itchy eyes. It makes your life miserable. There are 24 million people in the United States. This is a chronic health condition who have allergies and allergies can be a trigger for asthma. So air quality is really important. Understanding in particular, ozone is a trigger trigger for asthma. It can be a lung irritant. So that's something that we watch out for. And then what ozone does, uh, the science behind the ozone, it also increases plant growth. So the more ozone that's out there, carbon dioxide, ozone, that drives the growth of plants and creates these more intense releases of pollen in the spring. And then in the fall, the first frost comes much later because of climate change. So ozone, kind of the layer in the general warming of the planet has caused growing season is to double. So earlier pollen season, much later first frost that kills off ragweed that is an allergen in the fall. And what about pollution? Is that also something that we should be considering when we talk about air quality? I know ozone is one level, but is there anything else that contributes to pollution? Yeah, sure. So carbon dioxide, which is you, you can't really see, but again, that contributes to this more intense release. I think you also have obviously the wildfires that have happened. So these tiny particles from ash, power plants and factories, vehicle exhaust dust, all those things can trigger asthma or even allergies. There's something called an air quality index that the EPA puts out. And we generally try and track that. We tell folks to watch the air quality index. You know, I think you, you're familiar in certain cities, there's there's a orange alert or red alert. And they basically tell you don't go outside if you have upper respiratory issues. When the air quality index goes greater than 101, that's something that we generally tell people is a threat for people with asthma. So they should 
try and stay indoors. And this impacts outdoor air, but what about the indoor air? Is that something that you also consider when we talk about air quality? Definitely. So especially with COVID, we're spending more and more of our time indoors, but but you spend close to 90% of your time, over 90% of your time indoors. So stuff from outside can still track inside your house. So we recommend having HEPA air purifiers in your home to clean the air. Make sure that you have a HEPA vacuum cleaner as well. If you've got carpeting, don't sleep with your animals because if they're outside, they bring in pollen and dust. And then there are other things that indoor allergens that you could have if you're growing plants indoors, not only the pollen from the plants, but you could have mold in the soil. Those are things that impact your indoor air quality and and things you really want to watch out for if you're having, if you're inside and you're suddenly sneezing a lot, there could be those triggers indoors. All of those things are really important to remember. And, you know, I've personally seen that people are experiencing worse allergy symptoms over time. And every year, I feel like people are complaining more and more. And I think that it is directly related to climate change. And as you said, as temperatures rise, plants produce more pollen. And that increases, especially ragweed, they've found in studies in the fall. And then also the moisture from increased rain rainfall and floods can raise the risk of molds in our environment. And warmer temperatures also allow allergens to flourish in new regions and for allergy seasons to last longer. So I think that it's really important to remember all of this as we kind of advocate for better air quality measures, which is, I think, what AFA does a lot of. Is that correct? In terms of air quality measures, we don't measure it ourselves. We encourage people, as I said previously, to to look at the air quality index put out by the EPA. We also tell people to look for pollen counts, check the weather, and really understand kind of what the forecast is if you're going outdoors, if you have asthma or allergies. Yeah. And we know that those with lung disease are more impacted and more at risk when exposed to air quality. Studies show that air pollution exposure is linked to a greater risk of respiratory infections too. And I think that right now, the one thing that the pandemic has really illustrated is how sensitive our lungs are and how important they are to our function. It's really important to remember that there's no alternative to breathing, keeping our environment safe. And I think another important thing to remind people for indoor air quality is tobacco exposure. And I think that during the pandemic, a lot of people have been staying in indoors more. That's meant that more people are exposed to things like tobacco smoke and other indoor allergens. You mentioned pet dander, dust mites, rodents, cockroaches, mice, all of those things that are affecting people as they're staying indoors more. You mentioned COVID-19. There's some overlap with, is it allergies? Is it a cold? Is it flu? or is it COVID-19? And so we have, over the last year, gotten a lot of questions about that. We've got a graphic on our website that you could look at that looks at the various symptoms so you can make sure you know that it's allergies and not COVID-19. So we've got a symptom chart there. I mean, I'm not sure that's something that you want to talk about, but you mentioned COVID-19, so I just thought I'd insert that. The other thing I I just want to make sure to point out is that there are no worse outcomes if you have asthma and COVID-19. So that's, you know, early on that got, asthma got lumped in with COPD and respiratory illnesses, but there's not a lot of science out there for asthma specifically in terms of worse outcomes for COVID-19, but that's kind of off the track of this. So I I just wanted to make sure that as we talk about asthma and COVID-19, that we don't lead people to believe that you're going to be worse off with COVID-19 if if you have asthma. Yes, I agree. Those are two really important points that with allergy season approaching, that's something that I've been getting asked more frequently also, and people are nervous about is as their seasonal allergies start kicking in, they're going to be worried. Is it my allergies or is it COVID-19? And I think the important thing to remember is that even though allergies are termed hay fever, they don't normally cause fever. So fever is a distinguishing factor between COVID-19 infection and allergies. Both COVID-19 and allergies can lead to a cough, especially if you have underlying asthma and it's triggered by your allergies. So that's something to kind of be aware of, 
and not be scared of. As Kenny mentioned, COVID-19 does not seem to pose a greater risk to those with asthma, but I always like to tell my asthmatic patients that because it does affect the lungs in general, we want to keep our lungs healthy. And so that means we want to keep our asthma under control. That's just important no matter what we're talking about, whether it's pollution, whether it's a virus or whatever is happening out there, the stronger our bodies are, the better we are controlling our symptoms and making sure that we're on the right treatment regimen, the better it is for our health in general. And so that those are all important things to remember. And I think AFA has, like Kenny mentioned, a really great chart to kind of help you distinguish between is it allergies or is it COVID-19? And then of course, one important thing that Kenny had previously also wanted to mention was just the importance of regular check-ins with your doctor to make sure that your asthma is under control. Kenny, I don't know if you have anything that you want to talk about there. Yeah, definitely. The one thing I want to add to that, and I'm sure you might have seen this, is obviously the protocol in COVID-19 is to be wearing masks. And there have been some people who have said, well, I have asthma and I can't wear a mask. I can't breathe. And what we've told people is talk to your doctor first, but anyone who can't breathe through a mask probably has uncontrolled asthma and you really should be talking to your doctor about it. So just I insert that there because you still should be wearing a mask and wearing a mask will actually help you during allergy season as well. If you can't breathe through your mask, it probably means your asthma is not well controlled and you really should go see Dr. G immediately. I don't think people realize that asthma is playing a larger role in their lives until something tells them that it's uncontrolled. And if wearing a mask and having a hard time breathing is a sign that you have uncontrolled asthma, it's perfect. It's the perfect time for you to go see your allergist because I can tell you I had uncontrolled asthma for way too many years and pollen season was an absolute nightmare. I was waking up multiple times a night. I was showering multiple times a day to get the pollen off of me. And once I got my asthma in control. I sleep through the night during this pollen season and I can wear a mask without having problems. So I really, as a patient with asthma and seasonal allergies, I really would love to reiterate what Kenny just said is if you can't breathe through your mask, go to your doctor because you need to get your asthma under control so that you can manage seasonal allergies and you're not as concerned about, is it COVID or is it asthma? Is it seasonal allergies, that line will be a little bit less blurry for you if you're questioning either or. Definitely. If you're having difficulty breathing when you put your mask on, that's something that you should absolutely talk to your doctor about and figure out, is it uncontrolled asthma or is it something else? Other things to watch out for with uncontrolled asthma include coughing at night, coughing early in the morning, needing to use your albuterol or rescue inhaler more often, wheezing, having chest tightness, not being able to do your normal activities of living without becoming short of breath. Any of those things should trigger a call or a visit to your doctor. You know, now with access made a little bit easier with things like telemedicine, you shouldn't be nervous about leaving your home to contact your doctor. And there's just ways to get access to care right now that weren't available on previously. Yeah, I'd say that's really helpful, Dr. G. And and Courtney, I I empathize with you and your story because some of us are the worst patients. Like I'm a, I'm a terrible patient and I did not take this seriously. And I remember actually walking next to an allergist, a doctor, because we were together and we were doing some advocacy work on Capitol Hill. And so Capitol Hill is quite big and you're walking around to the various offices. And um, I had just, it was allergy season. It was in May. And she said, sounds like you're having some trouble breathing. And And I had no clue. I felt like I was fine. I'm a competitive athlete. I play a lot of squash. You know, I exercise and I felt fine. But she said, you know, you you sound like you should come in. You should go see a doctor. So I actually went to see her and she took a, a breathing test and I did have diminished lung function. And she said a lot of people uh, just don't know that this is happening. And she said you could have long term impacts on your lungs if you don't take care of your asthma now. So that really put the fear of God in me. I went to see her. I'm on my medication. I'm trying to be religious about it. So I I really understand what you're saying. And I remember looking at my notes, my medical record, and she said, 
patient doesn't identify well, or it's just, I had an unawareness of my condition. Courtney and I had a similar kind of story. We also met at day on Capitol Hill with the asthma and allergy network. I, I'm assuming that's where you were. And so that's where Courtney and I first met. And actually that's where our podcast first started <laughs> the vision for everything. So I mentioned a couple things to Courtney about maybe her eczema that led her to go and see her doctor. So yeah, sometimes those casual meetups with a doctor or somebody that's aware of asthma or allergies can be helpful. Yeah, it goes to show that sometimes people do just kind of live with their symptoms for a very long time and don't realize that they might have uncontrolled asthma or allergies and that there is a way to make their symptoms better or improve their general health status. It's very, very important to remember that. You asked why we do the Capitals Report and where we're ending up now in this conversation is exactly why we do the Capitals Report. I mean, because you first start talking about allergies, but then you get to asthma and you talk about severity and all these issues. So again, bring Bringing it back to the our allergy capitals report, while we look at seasonal allergies, there are a lot of serious things, both air quality, environmental issues, and the linkage to climate change, air quality, and your health is really important. Um, it's not just about medication; it's kind of taking care of your environment as well. So that's why we feel that the allergy capitals report is so important because it it evokes conversations like these. Can you go into a little bit more detail for our listeners about what the Allergy Capitals report is? What is it telling us and how you guys determine who make the top 100? So we look at the 100 largest cities in the United States. So that's how we start to begin with. We start with that data set and then we rank those 100 cities to be which are the most challenging ones to live in with allergies. And we use three criteria for that. Spring and fall pollen scores. So we actually get the pollen counts, then over-the-counter medication use. And then the final one is availability of board-certified allergists like Dr. G, because we feel it's really important that in order to be treat your allergies, that you see someone who knows what they're doing like Dr. G. So those are the three things that are really important. Those three criteria feed into other issues as well. The spring and fall pollen counts amplifies this issue of longer growing season and climate change. And I think when we first started this report years ago, that wasn't as much of a topic of interest now, but people, I mean, we, we've wrote about this a while ago, but now in the news, people are starting to understand with more severe weather events, how climate change is affecting our our health. But it's always been there for allergies and asthma. I mean, we humans are leading indicator for air quality, in particular those with allergies, because if it's a bad pollen season, if it's a longer growing season, you're just miserable. You're buying medications, you're going to your allergist, and you just want to be put out of your misery. And there are 20, 24 million people like that. I'm one of them. My family's one of them as well. You mentioned pollen, but you didn't mention quality of air. So pollution or smog, that's not something that you guys look into. No, we definitely look into that. And that is a trigger for asthma. So we always ask you to take a look at air quality, the air quality index. So that is what, again, the the EPA provides for you. We didn't include that as part of our report or as a ranking criteria because then it would just get too complicated. We just wanted to pick the ones that were very simple, but really amplified what the issues were. We had more criteria in the past, but when you drill down in the data, it wasn't as as meaningful or as, as simple as this. And I think you really capture where it is most challenging to live by using those three criteria. We have a medical scientific board that takes a look at all these criteria when we do the research and they help us think through how to formulate the rankings and how to do the weighting. And do you work with the, so the top 10 cities, do you work with them at all? Do you present them that the data? How do you go about spreading your information? They generally call us. So when, when we, when we send these reports out that they, they are, calling us and and they want to know about seasonal allergies and why they're such a challenge. The other thing that we do with this is we make sure that when we are advocating for our community, you mentioned the two of you met on the Hill, we use this report when we visit congressmen's, senators' offices and say, listen, this is your city. You rank number one. So um, it's just a matter of time because Scranton, Pennsylvania is number one. So we're, we're waiting for um, the president to, to realize this and give us a call because it, we can't quite get at them right, right now, but Scranton ranked number one. 
Kenny, I also understand that you have an asthma report of some sort that comes out in May. Can you talk more about that? Yes, we also do an asthma capitals report in addition to the allergy capitals report. The asthma capitals report looks at the 100 largest cities again, but the ones that are most challenging to live in with asthma. And we use we also use three criteria there, but they're a little bit more serious. One is death, uh, you know, mortality. The other is emergency room visits and the other is asthma prevalence. So those three things go into the rankings and they're they're built somewhat off of our allergy caps in that, you know, they're triggers for asthma, as we were just talking about. But the asthma capitals really highlight how life threatening asthma can be. We're talking a lot now about air quality, and that's where you really want to look at. Be really important to look at the outdoor air quality, your indoor air quality, avoid any kind of triggers that would possibly promote an asthma attack, which could end you uh, up in the ER. We do that report. We release it in May. May is Asthma Awareness Month. That should be coming out probably in the first week of May. We do it every two years. Great. I'll definitely watch out for that. That sounds like a great report. Both of them, actually. I'm really curious to see which cities and uh, areas are affected the most by both of these. Well, we were talking about the allergy capitals. And for anyone who's in New York, it ranks 58 on the list. And the interesting thing, again, learning about this over time, you sometimes think that being in a city because there are not a lot of trees around would be better for your allergies. But in fact, if scientists say, if you wanted to map what climate change might look like in the future, go to a city because they're warmer. And so there will be more intense pollen releases, longer growing seasons in those cities. When you find a city and you know, you've know you got bad allergies and you say, well, wait a second, there are no trees around here or not as many as out in the countryside. Urban environments are actually a good laboratory or test case for where climate change can go with respect to the plant life there and how you react with your allergies and asthma. So I just thought I'd throw that in as an interesting fact if you didn't know it. No, that's super interesting because I know that Dr. G was talking earlier, just the two of us about the Bronx and how bad it is in the Bronx. And I was wondering why in specific areas of New York, it's worse than others and maybe how it's placed in the city has an impact on it? Yes, definitely. And, and Courtney, you, you were asking a lot about air quality. So that's where you have the double whammy, you know, in, in addition to climate change and that you've got ozone, you've got air pollution from exhaust, trucks, they tend to be in these urban areas and it's concentrated. So it, it really has a bad impact on, on those in those environments. And the other thing that we recently did, again, to raise awareness, we released an asthma disparities report that was a 15-year update. There's still wide gaps, and you're hearing about this with COVID-19 as well. Black Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma than white Americans five times more likely to be treated in an emergency room. And when you look at the environmental issues, climate change, urban issues, health inequities, are, you could really see in some of those communities. So there's some structural issues, structural racism that all kind of feed into this stuff. So allergies, asthma, all those things, and some of the structural social determinants of health really have an impact on some of the underserved communities. I worked in the Bronx for a couple of years at Lincoln Hospital, and I am sure that that you know, Kenny, that the Bronx has some of the worst asthma rates in the entire country. And that's really related to a couple of things. Number one, the air quality in the Bronx is really poor because poor housing projects are near larger highways and that causes an increase in pollution and poor air quality. And then the housing itself is not taken care of properly. And so you have mold, you have rodents, you have cockroaches, that entire mix of poor indoor and outdoor air quality is the perfect breeding ground for poor asthma and allergy outcomes. Those are all of the structural changes, at least on an environmental basis that we need to really do more about. But yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And then I think COVID in particular has highlighted the fact that a lot of these underserved areas also do not have the best infrastructure in their hospital systems and how that contributes to uh, poor outcomes and increased death rates. So I think it's, it's a vicious cycle that somehow needs to be stopped. I'm really hopeful and encouraged by organizations like AFA who are diligently trying to look into how we can change 
the structural inequities. Yeah, thank you for that. It, it is, uh, you're absolutely right. All these issues we've seen for a while, you've lived it, you've seen it in the Bronx. And now we have an opportunity, given the awareness, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, but because it's there, we really need to run after this now and really try and pursue trying to make some of these changes. So I think the housing is an issue. I mean, it's a wide spectrum of things. If anyone really wants to learn about health disparities, you could visit our website, the afa.org slash asthma disparities. Our report is up there. It's quite a long report, but it's quite well documented. And it covers a framework for thinking about addressing these health disparities. And you could put in COVID-19, you could put in asthma, you could put in kidney disease. There are just so many conditions that drive health inequities or or that suffer from health inequities. And uh, some of those structural issues, we hope, can change things if we raise awareness level and partner with folks to try and uh, improve things. So that's definitely near and dear to what we're doing at, at AFA. If someone's listening and they want to try and spread awareness, what steps would you offer them? How could they start to just draw some more asthma awareness in their community and hopefully beyond? Sure. I, I mean, I, I would definitely visit our website, afa.org, A-A-F-A dot O-R-G, and then slash join. You could join there. It's completely free. We have an online community in, in this site was up before Facebook where if once you're diagnosed, it's a place to go if you need support from other community members who have asthma or food allergies. We have an Ask the Allergist, so we have, if you want to submit a question, we can go there and get it answered for you in 48 hours. AFA.org slash join, completely free. And then we will keep you in the loop on advocacy issues and things that you can be doing either in your own communities, in your home for yourself. We've got our certified asthma and allergy friendly program there where you could look up various products that pass a scientific standard that we've developed to help with your indoor air and improve your quality of life. And so going to our website is key. And then we also have an area where you could write your congressman for specific issues. So we'll keep people aware of issues that are going on in government, either state government or federal government that might have an impact on asthma and allergies. So definitely at our website, aafa.org is someplace I'd recommend your listeners to go to. Yeah, we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. And we'll also link to the different reports that we've been talking about so that you can go and read it if you're listening and you're intrigued to see if your city is one of the top, where, where it lands on the top 100 if you live in a big city. Mm-hmm. To round out this episode, just for those who do have allergic asthma or seasonal allergies, allergies and they're listening to this and they're very concerned about what they can do in terms of their health. Dr. G or Kenny, is there any advice you give them? How can they minimize the risks of symptoms this season? You know, one of the important things that Kenny has mentioned a couple of times is to keep a close monitor on the pollen counts outside. And when you do have high pollen count days, those are the days that you don't necessarily want to be working out outside. You might want to do your workout inside. You might want to keep your windows and doors shut on those high pollen count days. So you're not bringing the pollen from the outside into your home. Other things that you can do is keeping your humidity levels under 50% using a dehumidifier or an air conditioner to do that. And the reason for that is that dust mites, which are a big indoor air allergen, actually live off the humidity in the air. And so the more humid an environment is, the more dust mites you'll have. And of course, humidity also affects mold growth. And so it's important to keep the humidity controlled for mold. And then you want to put away food, cover trash, make sure that you're controlling for pests and cockroaches. Things that people don't realize is that particle pollution is affected by wood burning. So indoors and outdoors, wood burning is discouraged actually. And it just adds to pollution inside and outside, trying not to burn wood. Lastly, I always like to bring home the message of just having a smoke-free zone. If somebody in your home does smoke, making sure that they try to smoke outside, that they really should only smoke outside and not bring that smoke indoors. And maybe I could just add to that, go see your doctor. So I'm glad you're on, you're on this with us. And But the other thing also is public transportation, clean energy, not leaving your car idling. 
thinking about things that you could do in your everyday life to improve things for yourself and for others. So trying to combat climate change by using clean energy, take public transportation, don't drive someplace if you don't need to, walk if you can. So those are things to be thinking about and looking for environmentally friendly policies, whether it's in your local community, just get engaged, go to your town town hall meeting or school board meeting, buses staying outside of schools with their with them idling contributes to a lot of pollution. And there's some sub school districts that have no idling laws. So those are things that you can get engaged in. Any listener can in their own school district to help protect their individual health. So I just add that to the mix of things that you can actually do outside of your individual home and protecting yourself, but where you can contribute to protecting the community in general. That's really awesome. Bringing it back to climate change as well. And just Climate change impacts more than just the poles. <laughs> yes. Not, you know, we're impacted just as much as the polar bears. And I think that people forget about asthma. And as we have discussed today, we like to normalize our symptoms and not realize that it has a large role in our lives. Now we have to look at climate change a little bit differently through the lens of people with allergies and asthma and how you can help our world and your lungs. Thank you so much, Kenny. This was a great conversation and something that we, we've actually been wanting to do for a while. So I'm really glad that we were able to talk about this topic together. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for raising the awareness level. What you're doing is really important and we need to get the word out there. So thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www.itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.